welcome. Um, most of us know the, and are familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, right? And we know that the, most of them start with the same three words, right? You know what they are, right? Thou shalt not, right? Yeah, we, we're familiar with that. And then they're followed by some specific things that we, thou shalt not do, right? Have it, like, have any other gods before him, take his name in vain, steal, murder, commit adultery, those kinds of things. But there's one of the Ten Commandments right there in the God's Top Ten list that starts with a different few words. And uh, it starts by saying, remember. Remember. So in this case, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So right there in the Top Ten list, we get one command from God that emphasizes the importance of remembering. That's what we're really going to focus on tonight from the story of Esther. In fact, all through the Old Testament, if you read some of the laws, you know, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and all of those kinds of things, you're going to see all kinds of commands uh, for observing for a specific purpose, for reminding the Israelites at regular intervals throughout the year of who God is and what he has done on their behalf. Some of them took place weekly, like the Sabbath. Others took place monthly. Some took place yearly, and you're probably familiar with some of those as well, like Passover, the Day of Atonement, that were yearly celebrations. And now, why is that important? Why, why do you think God would have us remember throughout the years like that? The answer to that is because we are famous at forgetting, right? It's like we see God do some miraculous thing and then, you know, turn around, hit something new, and we're like, God, where are you? We forgot everything that he's done. It just disappears from our memory. So God set up these festivals and these uh, celebrations and these memorials. Uh, they weren't just parties or times to get together. They were intended to be constant reminders to the people of Israel of who God is and all the things that he had done on their behalf. And that's what gathering on Sunday instead of Saturday uh, was intended to be for the New Testament church when you get over to at the book of Acts. It was a reminder to them of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, see, Sunday is not Sabbath, and you, God defines things, and we don't get to redefine them. Saturday, Saturday is Sabbath, but Sunday became so important to the New Testament that uh, the church moved their gathering off of Saturday to Sunday as a reminder, and they intended to carry on the precedent established by God in the Old Testament for marking significant events with celebrations and observances. So that's, uh, and, and what was more significant to them in the New Testament and to us than the resurrection of Jesus. And so they gathered weekly as a reminder uh, and to rejoice in that sin had been atoned for. And so the same goes for the celebration of Christmas and Easter. Those were annual celebrations, annual observances, so that they were reminders of God's activity on the behalf of his people and his faithfulness. But just like Israel did back then, we do today. We focus on the celebration, and then we forget that it's supposed to be a reminder of what God is doing in our lives every day. Like the, uh, the festival of the first fruits back in the Old Testament, it wasn't just bring the harvest into the temple. It was supposed to be a reminder that God was uh, faithful and he was their provision. Passover wasn't just a time for eating a special meal and getting rid of yeast in, in, for a week. It was a reminder of God's miraculous intervention on their uh, part and that he was their deliverer. So God meant for Israel to absorb the meaning of the festivals and not just go through the motions. For us today, same thing. When we face difficult situations, hardships, trouble, we wonder what God's doing in our lives, we ought to be able to take the meaning of Sunday that we gather once a week, this once a week observance, uh, observance and uh, pull it into our lives, remind ourselves that because of the resurrection of Jesus, I can face anything because he's already done this on my behalf in the past. So, now, why did I bring up that uh, when we're supposed to be talking about Esther? Well, that makes sense in a few minutes. We'll just start with that. But let's get to uh, the chapter for tonight and go through what actually happens in the, uh, chapter 3. So, if you were not here last time, or if you forgot because it's been two weeks, 
When we last, le last left our story, you'll remember that Esther was forcibly caught up in this evil plan to make Xerxes forget about losing his best girl, Vashti. And she was the winner of this contest to find the most beautiful girl in all the kingdom. And if you were here last time, you've got a picture of what this contest was like. It was not a modern-day beauty contest where he walked down and said, okay, that's the one, that these girls were rounded up, stolen from their home, and then given to the king for his pleasure, and then sent off to a harem uh, where they would live the rest of their lives uh, if they weren't chosen. Now, this alone should make the story of Esther more compelling to us because... Uh, it's not this glamorous and wonderful story where the young slave girl gets promoted to be queen in this wonderful, you know, happily ever after kind of story. But it is a reminder that she plays her part well in the midst of pain and hurt and dashed dreams. And that's a reminder to us that we can also do the same thing. We don't have to wait for our life to get on track to that happily ever after, whatever we have got in our mind that it would be to be used by God in a powerful way. And in fact, we learned at the end of last time in Acts chapter 17, it reminds us that no matter what your messy backstory is, no matter what the messiness is of your life is right now, or who has pressed in upon you, or what has been stolen from you, your life has purpose and meaning now. You are designed and placed right where you are for the purpose of leading people to Jesus. And so at the end of chapter 2, we saw that this evil plan had unfolded and Esther is chosen and she is, uh, the, uh, and Xerxes threw a huge party for her. In the midst of this party, Mordecai, her uncle, overhears a uh, assassination plot against the king. He alerts Esther. Esther alerts the king, and the assassination plot is thwarted. Now, normally, when something like that happens, that it is rewarded immediately because, of course, it's the king's best interest to get people to want to be on his side, and he usually would lavish promotions and wealth and all kinds of things to make a big deal out of somebody who proved their loyalty to the king. But all Mordecai got was a footnote in the king's record. That brings us up to where we are for tonight, chapter 3, and verse 1, where we see, in somewhat of an ironic turn of events, Mordecai is not honored, but King Xerxes honors Haman, our new character in the story, son of Hamadatha the Agite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. So he's basically promoted to second in command here. Now, um, so... We need to learn something about Haman so we understand the conflict that's going to happen from here on out in the story. Now, there's a principle to keep in mind when you're reading the Old Testament especially, uh, that characteristics describing a person when they're first introduced help us understand his or her role in the story. Like, for example, Moses. First time we see him, he's drawn out of the Nile as a baby. And so later on we see in his life that he is connected with the Nile, uh, with the plagues, and is instrumental in drawing the Hebrews out from the bondage of Egypt, uh, uh, from under Pharaoh. David, he's introduced. He's the overlooked son of Jesse. He's a shepherd. And later on, we see that he becomes the most important son of Jesse and the shepherd and king of Israel. So here we have Haman. We've got some things that we learn about him. Son of Hamadatha the Agite. And you're like, okay. What is that? What is an Agite? Now, it seems irrelevant at first, but it is very important. It helps us to understand what will happen between him and Mordecai. So, a little history. We've got to jump all the way back to understand. To understand what an Agite is, we need to go all the way back to Exodus chapter 17 to understand who the Amalekites are. And so, they were the first group of people who attacked uh, Israel, or the Hebrews at the time, coming out of Egypt and on their way to the Promised Land. The Lord says to Moses, write this on a scroll, it's something to be remembered, I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under, the, under heaven. And so Amalek's the king, Malachites, that's where you get the name. Fast forward hundreds of years to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is God uh, many, many, many years later reminding them that that curse is still in effect what the Lord Almighty said, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they lay, waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. So this is the time when Saul is king, 
And so verse 3 tells us, he, he, uh, God says that Saul, King Saul attacked the Amalekites, destroy them and everything that belongs to them. Don't spare anything, men, women, children, everything, get rid of it all. And so jump down to verse 7. We could go through this slowly. We won't have time to get through the whole story. So Saul attacked the Amalekites, chased them after them, but instead of doing what God says, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and his people he totally destroyed with the sword. Now, he didn't kill everybody. He just was attacking the soldiers at this point. But Saul and the army spared King Agag and the best of the sheep, fat lambs, uh, fat calves, lambs, and everything that was good. So they used their own judgment. They said, okay, we we're going to not get rid of the good stuff. We'll just get rid of all the bad stuff. And, but God had told him to destroy everything, including King Agag. Now, uh, see there the, the uh, King Agag, Agites. Okay, this is the king at the time, and this is where you get the word Agites back over in the reference to Haman in Esther. And so if you know the story, just Saul's refusal to follow God's commands here led to the loss of his kingdom, and eventually David came in and became king. And so Samuel, so Saul doesn't do what God told him. The prophet Samuel comes in, and he does kill King Agag. So you're going, okay, so if King Agag died, not by Saul, but by Samuel, how did he become, Haman become his descendant? Well, if you read on over in 2 Samuel, you don't have time to look at all that, we'll find that David is still dealing with Am Amalekites well into his rule as king. So uh, it's clear everybody wasn't killed, even though the command was to wipe it out. They weren't all killed, and the Amalekites <clears throat> still remain way past King Saul, including some of Agag's family, and chief to this story is Haman. Now, last time I said when we talked about Mordecai, I said, remember what his ancestry was. And so uh, if we look back in Esther chapter 2 from last time, we learned that Mordecai is the, from the tribe of Benjamin, the, uh, from the family of Kish. Kish is the father of King Saul. So now we can see how there is a conflict that's going to erupt here. Um, there's a long history of bitterness and animosity between the Malachites and the Jews, specifically between the families of King Agag and Kish, right? Generational hatred's going on here. Haman comes to this place of authority in the Persian Empire, carrying deep-seated prejudice against uh, anyone of Jewish heritage, and even more so, a direct relative of King Saul. Now, that makes more sense now, while we read last time, why Mordecai would tell Esther, keep your Jewish heritage a secret for now, because uh, that he probably was very aware that there was a lot of anti-Semitism against uh, his family and all of the Jews going on and swirling around in, in, per in the Persian Empire. So that was very dangerous for her. So you can almost feel like this conflict is going to erupt before even anything happens, before they even meet, right? So there's all of this background. So we read on back to chapter 3. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. So, and remember, he's at the city gate. Remember last time we talked about that? This is the city gate. This is Xerxes' palace at the time. And the city gate's not swinging gates open. City gate's building. And so the city gate is where government and civil business is conducted. So that tells us that Mordecai is one of the, the officials, the royal officials in King Xerxes' court. But notice that he doesn't make a big deal about this, about not honoring Haman at first, because the royal officials asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? And then day after day, on and on and on, they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, when he won't, we, he won't uh, comply and kneel down, they told Haman about it to see if whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. It's like basically, you know, hey, it's like, we have to bow. You should have to bow too. And so they're irritated because he won't listen. And so they're going to go, hey, Haman, look at that guy over there. He will honor you. And they wanted to see what was happening. Now the end of verse 4 tells us why he won't, um, won't bow. Well, he had told them he was a Jew. Now, so he, his, it's his faith, his, his, his belief in God. That is the reason for not bowing. And so uh, uh, then verse 
5 says when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. So, enraged. so Haman notices Mordecai's unwillingness to bow. Then he starts doing a little investigation, learning who Mordecai's people were. He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. And um, instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Now, Haman's prejudice comes full bore into the front and center of everything here. When he discovered Mordecai's Jewish, his fury was fueled even more, and he didn't want to kill Mordecai only, but all the Jewish people. Now, because he had the authority being number two in the kingdom, he could have killed Mordecai probably without any even con consulting the king at all. He's like, look, the, he doesn't follow your commands. You said everybody has to bow to me. We're just going to get rid of him. But he didn't want that. That wasn't enough for him. So this is unbalanced in the extreme, right? He is way over, over, overboard here. You know, I mean, he's d irritated by the disrespect of one person, and then his response was to commit genocide. I mean, this is hard to fathom, right? Hard to grasp how somebody could get from there to there so quickly. The only way to really understand it is to really see the spiritual angle that's going on behind this, and that it's ultimately this plan and this idea was pushed by Satan himself. But he knew that God would send the Messiah through Israel. So if he can eliminate them, he thwarts the plan of God. Now, obviously, Satan always underestimates God's power and his sovereignty here. And so he, he um, doesn't understand that God's going to be on the side of his people and there's no way that he can win. You see this today, same spirit showing up today as uh, in our world. Satan couldn't stop Jesus from coming. So what does he do? He tries to stop the message from getting out. And so as you see this world grow darker and darker, you're going to see a lot of the attacks against the church escalate. And against this message, those are things are going to increase. Lots of stuff about evangelism being you know, uh, uh, intolerant and hate speech and all those kinds of words. You're going to hear that. But don't be dismayed or be fearful when those things happen. This is a spoiler alert for the story of Esther, okay? This attack is going to fail. <laughs> I mean, and just like it, all the attacks against God's people have and will fail ultimately. Persian Empire is gone. The Jews remain. Babylon, gone. Jews remain. Rome, gone. Crumbled empire. The church remains. And so whatever attack comes against the church today, uh, uh, you can count on that it, we, the church will remain. Absolutely. Doesn't mean that there won't be persecution. Doesn't mean that our freedoms won't be limited. Doesn't mean that the enemy won't look like he's gained a lot of ground. But the church will not ever, ever, ever be wiped away because it is kept by the power of God. You can count on it. But back to our story. After feeding his anger, Haman knows that he can't you know, wipe out an entire group of people without Xerxes' approval and his support. So he starts this plan of manipulation. Verse 7, in the 12th year of King Xerxes, just a side note, Esther's now been queen for five years. She's not the naive little Jewish girl who was caught up in this big beauty contest. She's been here a while. She understands how things work better. So she's in five years of being queen. But in the 12th month of the King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the purr, that is the lot, in the presence of Haman to select a day and month, and the lot fell on the 12th month, the month of Adar. So um, now the purr is this thing. It looks like a dice. It's little, small, about, and it has all these carvings on the side of it. This is very similar to what it might have looked like. This is from uh, an empire a couple hundred years in the future from Esther. But it had all these carvings on it, and so what they would do is they would take it and they would cast it out, and where it would roll, then they would read the carvings from what was on this one or that one or the other one, and then what they would do is they would try to use it to pick out the best day of the year to have this, this uh, plan uh, uh, initiated. And so what they did was they cast these stones or pulled them out of a bag uh, one for every day of the year. So 365 uh, times they do this and they read them and they pick the best day according to the, the, the gods who is guiding this. 
and they used this for divination so they would have the best chance of this succeeding the way they wanted to. And so you notice that they started the divination on the first day, uh, the, in the first month, and the best day is in the 12th month. So they, they start this divination process, but the plan is not going to be carried out for 11 months later. So he goes and he's, he's like, now he's got, uh, this is the day we're going to do it. Now he goes and starts talking to Xerxes. He says, there's, and so this is what he says. He says, there's a certain people, notice he doesn't tell them who it is, dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom whose customs are different. So he's sowing a seed of fear in here from all of those other peoples who do not obey the king's law. Now they're subversives. They don't follow what you want to do, what you want them to do. And it's not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. Now we know from the thing that happened with, with Vashti that he is very easy to be manipulated if you couch it in the terms of it's what's good for the kingdom and what's good for you. And so <clears throat> he... He said, basically says that these people out here are, who are different, they're difficult, and they're dangerous, and it's not in your best interest to have them around. And, so, and then he goes on, and he says, if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them all, and I will put 10,000 of talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men to carry out this business. So Haman is says, you know, I'm so committed to you and the health of the kingdom and your safety. This is so important that, you know, it's so urgent that I will fund the project. He's saying uh, that this is kind of twofold in effect. He says, first of all, I'm saying, you know, your safety is paramount to me. I'm so convinced that this is a problem that I'm going to put 10,000 talents of silver. That's 3,000 tons of silver uh, to this project. Now, it's not probable he has this amount of money, maybe he does, but the hyperbole indicates the level to which he is committed to this idea, even going into debt for it, maybe. And then he tries to appeal to the desire of the king to refill the coffers of the royal treasury because they've been depleted after that whole war with Greece, you know, five years ago. So uh, he tries to bribe the king here. And then so but the king says, he listens to him, and he said, he took his signet ring from his finger, gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agai, the enemy of the Jews. Notice how he's described there again. Keep the money, the king says to Haman, and do with his people as you please. So basically he says, I don't care. I don't care. Do whatever. If you think this is a big deal, go ahead. Take care of it. And he gave him his signet ring. Now you might know that from history, that his signet ring for a king was his stamp of approval. And so by giving the, the uh, Haman his signet ring, gave him the authority to act as the king. So he wrote a law, the king stamped on it with a signet ring. It was Xerxes' law. So verse 12 goes on to say, then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned, and the rest of this says that he, they wrote this law, uh, this new edict, and all the people's languages, and then sent it out, and this is the signet ring here, written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. That just means that he had the authority of the king there. <clears throat> Verse 13, dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the orders to destroy, kill, and annihilate. Again, we've got extreme words here. Uh, when one would do, he says, it's like overkill on the, the language here. All the Jews, young, all women, children, uh, everybody, you know, so there's no one's, no one's exempt from this. Even babies and little children who are clearly not defying the king or any kind of threat to Persia or Haman, uh, he wants to include them in there. Do it on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. And here's the hook to get the norm, normally law-abiding citizens to get in on this thing right here because they're not sending soldiers out there to kill all these people. They're, he, they're telling them the citizens of the provinces, this huge empire, saying, okay, if you don't like your Jewish neighbors or you want their donkey, you want their land, you want their house, whatever it is, on this one day, 11 months from now, you can kill them, take anything you want, no consequences. And so this is why how he pulls in the people in the, uh, around the kingdom to get involved in this, make sure this is, or this is carried out. So... At the end of chapter 3, this edict is delivered, and just as you might expect, that the, the people were bewildered. And uh, that's what verse 15 says there. I mean, because they're 
There's no context for this at all. No explanation. It comes completely out of the blue. It'd be like if the news showed up tomorrow and said every member of the Baptist church across America will be killed on Christmas Day in 2023, we'd be going, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, because that's how it was. No explanation. No what happened or why the Jews were targeted. There was just an edict, the stamp of the king, this is what's going to happen. And so this all seemed very hopeless. The city's in an uproar. Uh, the Jewish people are bewildered. But inside, the king and Haman sit down to drink. There's this callous indifference uh, between Haman and the king. Once again, very much pleasure-seeking is their only concern. And so that's where we end with the actual facts of chapter 3. But we always ask, what's the application? What do we learn about God from this? And so the key takeaway from this part of the story is in a very easy to overlook detail and, and, and that resides in verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, you're like, okay, what's the big deal about that? But this God's timing is so key to what God always does. And so this edict was written down, translated, and sent out to the whole kingdom, telling them that this thing is going to go into effect on the 13th day of the first month. Now, we back up to Le Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. We learned that on the 14th day of the first month is the Lord's Passover. Okay? Now, this is really important. I love this detail because this edict that the, all the Jews are going to be destroyed is sent out while these people are getting ready to celebrate Passover. And what do the Jewish people celebrate at Passover but to remember in their history an impossible situation when they were in bondage to Egypt but God miraculously intervenes and set them free. Okay? And so in this story, when this degree, dis decree is issued on this specific day, it's almost as if God says, are you going to trust me or not? Are you going to trust me or not? I am the same God who brought Egypt to his knees. Is Persia any different? Is Xerxes different from Pharaoh? No. Is any king or any kingdom more powerful than I am? I think in this very, very specific timing here, there is a call for us today to face any threat, whether personal, relational, in our business, in our homes, or even in, in a national or an international sense, with the faithfulness of God in view. Because is this not what God says to us when we face desperate moments? Is this not what he says to us? Look back, see what I've done, and look forward. Look forward. Look back and remember, then look forward in faith. Because remember what God has done for you in the past. Then trust him now, no matter what the future brings. This is the message to us. Now, does that mean that's go it's always going to work out the way we want? You know that that is not the truth. Uh, because, But when we get disappointed and fearful uh, b uh, because we anchor our hope in the wrong place, right? It, it's in this life so often we look for our comfort and our hope and not where God tells us to place our faith. You know, he, he tells us to put it in him. And if our hope is in anything on this, uh, in laws or government or anything in that we can do, any manipulation we can come up with or anything in this world, we will be disappointed because those things will fail us. If your faith is in anything here, in the here and now, it can be taken away. But if your hope is in him, then it is rock solid and immovable. Remember what we said in week two about our hope and how different it is from the hope of the world? That our hope is based not in future change, but in past certainty. So when the temptation to fear comes, to fear the actions of others, or feel like you're abandoned, or you're in peril, just like these people did, hear the voice of God calling you to remember what he has already done for you. And in this story, we'll see in a few weeks, that the very means planned by Haman for the destruction of the Jews was the means that God uses to bring about their deliverance. This is what God does. 
This is always what God does. So if you keep just going over to the New Testament, get to the Gospels, you know what? You'll see this exact dynamic play out in, uh, in, on the cross of Christ. The, uh, the means by which Satan intended to thwart the plan of God to free us and bring us salvation is the exact means that God used to deliver us. Isn't that marvelous? That is so magnificent and wonderful to sit with that for a minute. And what we take into that into our life is sometimes God allows things or even sends things into our life. The things we fight against the most are intended to bring about the thing that God is trying to do in our lives. And he's trying to do his greatest work and he'll use those things and we kick against it and kick against it and kick against it. So, look at it. As we wrap up tonight, I'm going to look at a verse in Romans chapter 8, 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? The question is asked, and you can find whatever you will face in the entirety of your life in one of these words, right? Trouble or hardship? Yeah, that's pretty broad. <laughs> that will cover a lot of things. Persecution, that's uh, what the people in Exodus Day were facing because of their faith. They were facing uh, the persecution. Famine, that can be actual no food, or it can just be want or lack in your soul. Nakedness, again, it can be very literal, or it can just be an exposure. Danger, another really broad word there. <laughs> and, or, and we can get the sword, meaning death. And we, see, we often see death as, the, as that final enemy where, oh, we finally lose everything. But through Jesus, for those who believe in him, it is the final means where we don't lose, but we gain. It's like we are catapulted through death into the fullness of life that he promises us. It is not as closed door. It's an open door to everything that we ever want. And skip on down from verse 35 to verse 37. It says, no, and all these things, that's all that whole list there. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And now that word conquer in the Greek means extraordinary, exceeding victory in a continual state. And so that, is, that doesn't mean one time you win. This is on and on and on victory to perpetually increase in Triumph. So we're squeaking by here. <laughs> the NAS says it like this, but and all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. Like I said, not squeaking by, not wondering how this thing's going to go, who's going to win, who's not going to not. We are super conquerors, not in ourselves, but in him who loved us. You might be saying, okay, I know what that says, I see it, but how can I trust that when People still die, hardships still come, uh, governments, you know, per persecute, Christians suffer all kinds of things. It is a constant struggle with one problem after the other. How can that be true that we overwhelmingly conquer? Once again, where's your focus? Where's your focus? And what are you hoping? Something that will happen? Or is your hope in something that already has happened? We who are saved by grace conquer based on what has already taken place. Christ has already won the most important victory for us. And that victory, our place in God's family, our share in his inheritance, our share in his glory cannot be taken away from us by any means, by anything in that list or anything you can come up with. We conquer in the sense that none of those things can overcome what God's power has gained for us through Christ. That's where our focus has to be, and that is what we have to to remember no matter what we face. The call every time we face difficulty, whatever it is, every time we face hardship is a single word. Remember. Remember. Remember what God has done for you in the past. Just start with your salvation. Just sit with that, and that's enough. If that is enough to shout to you that he has not left you alone and loves you with an unending, everlasting, unbreakable love that will triumph over everything you face every single time so if you're facing an overwhelming situation the takeaway today from esther chapter three is you are not defeated by your heartaches you're not defeated by your failures your setbacks your past mistakes your pain or anything anybody else throws at you you are more than a conqueror not through yourself not through your own ability you are more than a conqueror through him 
who loves you. He has not abandoned you. Listen to his voice. Get in his word. Dwell there. Listen to your godly friends, to pastors, to music. Um, he says to you, like I think he was saying to them and the Jews in yesterday, I got you. I got you. Now, trust me. Look back. Remember. Then look forward. And don't be afraid. You will overcome. It's probably not going to look like the way you think it's going to. But he never loses anyone or anything. We are more than confident through him who loves us. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, we just thank you that we don't have to wonder how it goes. We don't have to sit there and go, yeah, maybe I'll win, maybe I won't. But you've already promised us that the greatest victory that we ever have or ever needed has already been uh, accomplished by you on the cross at Christ. God, help us to trust that. Help us to lean into that. Help us to believe it, even in the darkest days that we face. God, that you uh, are enough for us and that you have won the greatest victory that, and we can rest in you. We thank you for all that you give us. Help us to remember. Help us to remember the truth of what you tell us and that we can trust you and look forward and not be afraid. For it's in your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.